Good morning. Thank you for joining us here on the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside Tyler Keith. We appreciate you tuning in this morning. And again, I'm going to try to be giving my skills and my talents a little bit of expansion as, again, I try to work the board. So please bear with us because it's going to be a hot mess. Let's just go ahead and admit it. Uh, a lot of buttons to push here as you are trying to get the show on the air. But you know what, Tyler? You have to learn new things in life to keep your brain going and your heart ticking. You do, and, and it's uh, there's a lot to go, there's a lot going on here. It's a lot more complicated than maybe it looks on the surface, but you know, we're, we're all learning in the process. But you do want to stay with us, though, because we have a really good show today. We are going to be taking you to outer space. We're going to be talking bees, business, and a bit of a ba battleground. Now, if that's not a tease, I don't know what Whoa. is, Tyler. Well, I'm excited. I'm ready to go. <laughs> but first, uh, as we do here on the Oakland County Megacast, want to remind everyone, you can watch and listen to us on Civic Center TV. Very easy for you to do. We have the broadcast up live on that. You can also watch us at the Birmingham Area Municipal Access, 89.3 Lakes FM and 88.1 FM The Biff. If you have cable, tune into Channel 15 on Comcast and Channel 99 on at and t But we want to go ahead and get the show started quickly with a quick update on all the headlines. A lot of news happening overnight. And we are going to start with the Democratic National Convention kicked off Monday night. I am sure you tuned into it as yeah. well, Tyler. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer was one of the first speakers Network television picked up. Whitmer had about five minutes of speaking time in which she mostly focused on the coronavirus crisis. It wasn't her speech, though, at the podium that yeah. sent social media a buzz. Prior to her national televised speech, the governor was caught in a hot mic moment saying it's not just Shark Week, but Shark Week blank. Uh, so a little bit of controversy there with the governor, but she did laugh it off and on uh, Twitter, though, went wild with that. Last yeah, night. Oh, it, it's it, it's it's perfectly fine for our leaders to have a little bit of a personality, albeit a little edgy, a little edgy and colorful language. But it's perfectly fine. Well, this is the governor that ran on the platform. Fix the damn. Roads. Exactly. So what do you expect? I don't know when I was growing up. That word was on the no-no list. Yes. So things is. are things are changing now in today's uh, society. Also making news in the headlines today on CivicCenterTV.com, Michigan may sue federal government over post-service delays. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer's administration is exploring ways to sue the federal government over United States Postal Service delays that some say could impact the November election. Whitmer's administration is in discussion with other states about a multi-state lawsuit to ensure that the U.S. Postal Service is aggressive in its efforts to ensure that absentee ballots are delivered to local clerks' offices in time to be counted. You'll find that story as well on Civic Center TV. And I think, Tyler, as we continue to go closer to the election, this is going to be a hot-button issue that is not going away. Ron, we had record turnout in the primaries in, in Michigan for absentee votership, and, and it's been something that's been increasing all across the country during the pandemic. The pandemic's going to be ongoing, continuing through to November for those elections, and there are going to be a lot of people that will be voting by mail because they feel it's the safest option. They feel it's the most convenient option for them and their lifestyle, and any obstruction to that is going to be a huge problem for voters. We're going to see if they will get the money that they want. Mm -hmm. The post office, the Democrats trying to get billions of dollars to help with the postal service. Also on Civic Center TV, no surprise here. Concerns grow as college students return to campuses. Students are beginning to arrive at university campuses throughout Michigan for the fall term. So too are there college parties and dorm life that could spread COVID-19. Central Michigan University in Mount Pleasant just celebrated its welcome weekend. A picture posted in the school newspaper shows at least one large gathering without masks, very little social distancing. University officials across the state have put measures in place to try to safely return students to campus. But you could put those measures in place, but if the students don't follow them, they don't work. 
Yeah, it, it's, it's all about participation and acceptance of these regulations by the students. Like you said, Ronnie, uh, s college campuses are such social environments, whether it be in the classroom or definitely outside of the classroom. And for those that are experiencing the college lifestyle for the first time in their life, it's the first time they've been independent and living on their own, making their own decisions on a daily basis. It's going to be tough for a lot of those people to make the smart decision to not be as social maybe for the first six months to a year of their college experience and it's it's probably going to arise some problems one of the issues the students that are living off campus how do you try to control that if they're living in a private residence their own apartment that is going to be pretty hard for the uh, administrators to you know force these um, parties to not happen or to even maintain some type of social distance or to enforce these students to wear masks. Yeah, it's going to be really tough to enforce that, and especially for those that live off campus. And maybe it's a little bit easier in on-campus housing, housing where you can be written up and you can be fined and it's part of your uh, it's part of your agreement for living in dorms, but for those that are off campus and those that are just passing through possibly on campus, it's going to be a lot tougher. Plus, you have such a volume of people on these campuses that enforcing every little violation in an abundance of caution is not plausible. Well, here's a little bit of positive news coming out of Michigan, but this obviously could change here in the next coming weeks. Michigan added 465 new cases of coronavirus and one death on Monday. So the cases are continuing to plateau right now in the state of Michigan. It brings the state's total COVID-19 cases to 93,185, the number of deaths to 6,325. Now the lower daily count of the virus Huge contrast to last week when we saw the number of cases trending upward to an average of 700. The state, though, did attribute those higher numbers of daily cases to a larger than usual test returns. And, Tyler, that could be because a lot of people were getting tested to go back to college or go, to go back to work, to go back to school, things of that nature. Plus, we are seeing the issue of the delays of the test returns from the labs. Yeah, I think that, like you said, the greater the greater demand for testing because of these social interactions that are oncoming like schooling whether it be uh, in K through 12 situation or on campus and college situation whatever the case may be that on top of the general greater demand for these tests and the delays that we've seen we're going to see more of these situations where things are going to be a little bit delayed in the results and we're going to have these minor spikes usually they're reported as being a result of extra cases that were backlogged. So you can find those stories and more on Civic Center TV uh, because each and every day before we come into the studio, we do update those and uh, try to bring you the very latest news because this virus is not going away. I think a lot of people thought by now that we would start to see it diminish. And, but we are in the middle of this pandemic still five months in. So. We are going to uh, continue to bring you the very latest news. And when we come back, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're talking bees. Sweet success in the D with bees. We'll be right back on the Oakland County Megacast. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet Wear facial coverings when you leave your home and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside Tyler Keith. And we would like to say thank you to the Greater West Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce for being our Facebook partner of the day so you can also watch us live over there on the greater west bloomfield chamber of commerce on their facebook live so we want to go ahead right now and we want to talk bees 
a little bit of B. So our first guest is turning empty urban spaces into colonies and finding some pretty sweet success. You knew I had to get that in there. Brian Peterson, Brian Peterson, Roos, founder of Bees in the D. It's a nonprofit dedicated to honeybees. Brian, thanks for being with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. Morning, Ronnie and Tyler. Okay, so you have one of the most interesting nonprofits. Tell us first, what's your mission and why in the world did you even start this? So our nonprofit um, focuses on education and conservation of honeybees, but also other pollinators, because when we benefit our honeybees, we benefit all pollinators. And um, I'm a fifth grade teacher, so education's at my heart. And I was given the opportunity uh, about 12 years ago to go up to Beaver Island to take a course, a two week course on beekeeping when I found out it was free that the Women's Garden Club of Rochester was covering the cost, I was all about it. And I just, uh, I, I caught the bug. See, I'll do some puns as well. And I just fell in love with beekeeping. And uh, when we finally did move down to the city, uh, throughout those years, uh, beekeeping is, you, you're hearing about celebrities that are doing beekeeping because of how relaxing it is and calming it is to go into a hive. And I, I can agree with that. And they were kind of there for me during some rough times. And when I moved to the city, when I was reading about all the problems that our bee populations were having, I thought it's time for me to give back and be a voice for the bees. And so I started the nonprofit Bees in the D. And that was about five years ago. And I have been blown away with the response and uh, the open arms of businesses and schools and other uh, nonprofits. And it's been a wonderful thing. I have to say the thought of putting on a suit and coming in contact with bees that sting does not really sound relaxing to me. How do you convince yeah. kids this is cool? So Ronnie, that's the exciting thing about this. Uh, for example, one location we have is at the downtown boxing gym, which is an after school uh, opportunity for some of the Detroit youth and they had the exact same response as you uh, that they were kind of nervous about the bees and that they're going to attack me and you know you get that whole alfred hitchcock feeling um, but we were lucky enough that uh, fardman uh, cares donated 50 uh, children's bee suits and we suited up the kids and it was so magical to watch that fear just dissolve as they realized that honeybees are actually very docile creatures and you're actually welcome in their home as long as you are, uh, you know, you take slower motions, you're, you're courteous. Um, and I loved watching that dissolve. And then of course, there's a little sweet after uh, thing that we could give them a little honey, which uh, everybody loves honey. So I'm glad that you said that because that's the response of many people. But when we do our hive tours, it's, it's so cool to see the change in people's feelings about honeybees. Brian, are there other opportunities beyond just the hive tours for kids, for families, for people in the general public to engage with the bees and learn a little bit about beekeeping as well or get involved? Well, are you talking this year or because <laughs> of course with the pandemic, um, it's been very challenging for not just our organization, but all nonprofits and small businesses. But um, if it was a normal year, yeah, we do a lot of events. We do public honey harvest. Um, we do workshops where we can uh, learn more about bees. And then I actually do an all day workshop where if people are interested in beekeeping, we, I have a real hands on approach. And so that's why we have, can't do it this year where we actually go in the hives, but we've been creative. Uh, we've been working with Yelp. We already did a virtual hive tour on our hives that are on top of the Shinola hotel. Um, and it was such a huge success that Yelp has asked us to come back and do a follow-up. And so we're gonna be doing that on September 22nd. We're gonna do a live honey harvest with our friends at Spun Sugar Detroit that opened up a candy shop. And we're gonna actually harvest the honey virtually. Um, and then you can actually um, purchase some of the honey and some of the sweets that she has at her shop. So Brian, real quick, uh, I want to go ahead and you mentioned the pandemic during COVID-19. I know your organization has a GoFundMe page going. How is that going? And 
it must be hard right now because you're competing with so many other nonprofits <laughs> that need money in a time where people are, you know, maybe unsure about their financial future and not donating as much. Well, let me first just say this, the giving spirit of Detroit area, Metro Detroit is amazing. Um, looking at the amounts of money that people are donating, uh, we're a part of the Rock Family Community Challenge right now. And we're blown away with the response, you know, because I, I agree, I mean, with so much uncertainty with your finances, the fact that people are supporting, it, it just shows the spirit of the Detroit area that we want to help keep our small businesses. And it is tough being a smaller nonprofit to compete with some of the larger nonprofits and uh, other businesses, but we're all in this together. You know, we're, we're working together. And so, you know, I've been actually very pleased and uh, we're so thankful for the many donations that have been rolling in. And this uh, charity challenge we're a part of right now goes for the whole month. Um, and so we're just, uh, you know, trying to keep our heads above water, just like a lot of other people. So you, you mentioned the charity challenge that you're doing. Can you go into more of a, to, to more detail about that? Are there other uh, organizations that are participating and, and how can people get involved or get more information? Well, actually it's uh, the Rock family. So uh, Bedrock uh, is, is hosting it. They do this every year and it is very, I love that they give back and try to help our nonprofits. Um, right now, if you want more information about it, you can you know, go to the Rock Family Community Challenge, but specifically, it's a little easier probably to navigate to Bees in the D. Um, if you go to our social media pages, we've been posting all about it and challenging people to give. And um, so if, if you know, you've got $5 sitting around and you wanna help save the bees, um, and we really try to explain the importance of the bees you know, because there's so many great nonprofits out there. Um, I give to a lot of the other ones when I think of like some of the, the uh, dog profits and they're, they're so cute, the puppies, and you're kind of like a bee. But we've got to think about the fact that bees um, help provide the diversity of food that we enjoy. Without those pollinators, we wouldn't have a lot of those foods. They say one third of all foods that we put in our mouth are reliant on pollinators. Um, and so that includes food that we, you know, feed our cattle and even our pets. Um, so really the bees are right at the base of the foundation of helping out our ecosystem and our food industry. So we are talking with Brian Peters, the Peterson Roost. Y you know, Brian, I do have to apologize because I have not had my coffee today. I'm trying to start <laughs> the day off with water and, uh, I need that extra caffeine, I think. So you're the founder of Bees in the D. Why do you think we, we are seeing such a decline of, is it just honeybees or all bees right now? Yeah, unfortunately it is pretty much all pollinators, bees. Um, there are about 450 different species of bees in Michigan alone, 4,000 in America, 20,000 worldwide. It's, it's a it's a deadly combination of things. Um, of course, pesticides, but there's a lot of diseases now, now that we're a global society. Uh, there is a, a parasite known as the Varroa mite that really weakens our bees. And so we really need to maintain our hives to make sure that we're keeping them healthy. And like I said, the pesticides, um, in some areas, the loss of habitat. Uh, so it is a lot of different things that are affecting our bee populations. So Brian, you mentioned that you were uh, an educator. Are you still teaching at, uh, was it elementary, fifth grade? Yep, I teach uh, actually in two locations. I'm a fifth grade teacher at Musson Elementary in Rochester, and I'm actually an adjunct professor at Oakland University. And yes, we have switched to, I'm getting really good at this Zoom thing. Uh, we have switched to the remote platform for now. Um, I'm hoping in the, in the future I get to see my kids face to face in person. Um, it's very challenging, but we've got to keep ourselves and our kids safe. Uh, and so uh, we're going to do the best that we can uh, to keep our kids uh, educated and keep them socializing. Um, and really our district in Rochester in reading about other districts have done a great job. I know there's a lot of tension about this, but we're in this together. So we really need to support each other, parents and, 
and, and teachers need to work together to make this a success. So, you know, I have to bring up the talk of the murder hornet. So we're going through <laughs> COVID and then news comes out about this <clears throat> killer hornet going on out there. Is it for real? Is it not for real? Do we even have so to worry about exist. it? So it does exist. It does exist. And I strongly encourage you to watch some of National Geographic's videos about them because it is mind boggling about these hornets that originated in the Asian area. They have made their way over to the European area where the bees have not figured out how to battle them yet. And there has been some talk that there has been a few uh, random ones uh, found in the west coast of the United States over in the Seattle area. So they do exist, but it's not, it's been hyped up quite a bit. Um, they are not here in Michigan. And there is a cicada killer, which is another kind of a wasp that looks very similar. So I've been getting a lot of calls about them. And that cicada killers does not uh, affect our honeybees like the, the killer wasp does. Well, we need the uh, killer wasp to just stay away because we don't need <laughs> anything else here in Michigan. I want to get a look back a little bit to your nonprofit. Where exactly are your hives located? And as someone who has spent a lot of time in the city of Detroit, there are a lot of areas now where blight has taken over, but we're also seeing somewhat of a return to nature Talk a little bit about how you're using some of these urban areas to bring bees to the D. I'm glad you mentioned that because that in itself is why Detroit is becoming a leader in urban beekeeping because of we have so much green space. Uh, but our hives are peppered throughout downtown Detroit and throughout Detroit and actually five counties. We have 175 hives all throughout the five counties that make up the Southeast Michigan area. Um, we're at about 60 different locations, and some of those are rooftops, like you heard me say Shinola Hotel, Foundation Hotel. If you are on the camera, you can see my virtual background is the TCF uh, Convention Center. Um, but a lot of our hives are also in the urban gardens. Uh, Detroit of Bloom, Palmer Park, Willow Rose, all these gardens uh, that uh, Michigan Urban Farming Initiative, we're, we're growing fresh produce for the communities and the bees triple if not quadruple if not more than that the yields from those gardens and so the bees are helping to provide healthy foods for our community and we're actually working with the land bank right now looking at the core city area we are a little ahead of schedule which we're happy to report it was our 10-year plan but we're looking to upcycle shipping containers we're working with studio detroit which is an incredible architect firm um, and we are going to be creating a education and community center uh, where people can learn more about bees, but also use this center uh, for community purposes. So we're very excited about that. And we're excited to see how many spaces are turning green in Detroit. And I want to share this too. Our hives that are in the city, because we have them in the suburbs and in rural areas, are actually stronger in doing better in our city locations and that's quite amazing and a testament to how much green space we have in Detroit itself. Brian, your, your nonprofit is the bee's knees. If people want to get <laughs> involved, I had to, I had to do it, I'm sorry. If, I, if people want to get involved, are there volunteer opportunities throughout the Metro Detroit area and, and how can people get information on those opportunities? Yes, definitely. Um, it's been a little bit of a disappointing year because we haven't had our in-person events, so we haven't needed our volunteers, but boy, they're itching to get going. Uh, we've had a few volunteer workshops and we're hoping to revitalize those once it's safe for us to gather. Uh, but we do have a Facebook page. It's just Bees in the D volunteers and it's almost 200 strong already. That shows you how many people really want to get involved with helping our pollinators. All you have to do is request to join that group and we put updates in there or they can email us at bees at bees in the D um, and let us know that they're interested in volunteering and hopefully as things start to get a little bit more safe we can plug people in some people may want to help at our booths some people may want to actually learn beekeeping and get in the hives and help manage them so there's a lot of wonderful opportunities and with that said we do a lot of really cool partnerships where we use those volunteers 
Um, for example, we have a couple beers in the making with honey, one with Eastern Market Brewery where we have hives on their roof and with Dragon Mead. Um, and also we have hives on Detroit City Distillery's uh, roof, the old factory, the Stroll's ice cream, and it's coming back by popular demand. We take honey and put it in a bourbon barrel. Uh, we did this last year and age it for about three months and it makes a bourbon flavored honey. And then they put the bourbon back in and it makes a honey bourbon. We sold out in 90 minutes last, last year. So we are doubling the amount of honey we're gonna make this year. And that's gonna be available uh, closer to the holiday season. Uh, and if you don't mind, I'd also like to share, we are doing one in-person event we're very excited about. It's gonna be social distancing dinner outside at the Whitney. Um, we have two hives there at the Whitney and it's gonna be a honey themed dinner where you also get some of our honey and some other wonderful things. Um, and so tickets are on sale for that. That's September 14th at the Whitney out on their patio. So we are speaking with Brian Peterson, Peterson Roost. I just can't get that right today. And it's such an <laughs> easy name as well. So Brian, I've been on your Facebook page and I invite everyone to go on and watch the videos. You are amazing at sharing how all this process works and takes place what's one thing you want people to know about beekeeping and and how the process actually works well thank you for going to our page i love to do the educational videos like i said education is at my heart and so every friday you've probably seen my forager friday videos where i like to talk about different plants throughout you know the city and the area um and so uh it's just been a lot of fun to share our passion, you know, through those videos. And I try to keep them short and sweet. And then also we've been trying to do some educational things on our webpage at Bees and the D Junior for teachers so that they have a go-to or parents uh, that allow kids to have another activity that's unique and fun. Brian Peterson, founder of Bees in the D, we thank you so much for being with us. And I am going to volunteer Tyler as a volunteer to go into the hive as soon as you get that started again. Okay, but Ronnie, we're gonna get you in too. I, I'm gonna change your opinion about that. You're gonna be mesmerized idea. by how amazing the hives are. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, again, Bees in the D, check out their Facebook page, go to their website. As Brian said, the COVID-19 pandemic is hitting all of the nonprofits pretty hard right now. So if you have $1, $5, $10, donate to their cause. They are doing, Tyler, such amazing things with so many different organizations and businesses here, not just in the city of Detroit, but throughout Metro Detroit and the entire state of Michigan. So we wish them uh, continued success. And I can't wait to pick up some of their honey because when it's freshly made, it's it's really amazing. Yeah, and, and the bees are so critical to our to our ecosystem, to our food systems and distribution systems. And having bees in the D and other organizations in Metro Detroit that are bringing beekeeping back to more of a forefront uh, in our in our local area certainly helps with our local economy with the local resurgence of Detroit as well and it, it's been great to see and, and Brian and his team do great work so we are going to go ahead and uh, take a quick break and when we come back we are going to go from bees to business how one guy one local guy turned his passion into a business and what it took to do that and how he is managing in the middle of this pandemic. We'll be right back right here on the Oakland County Megacast. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, 
answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hi, I'm Dr. Jonay Caldoun. I'm the Chief Medical Executive for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The people who are at highest risk of getting severely ill from COVID-19 are the elderly and those with chronic medical conditions. That includes people with heart disease, diabetes, COPD, or those who have compromised immune systems. People who are in those categories should right now be staying at home as much as possible and not going out if it is not essential. If you fit into one of those categories, those are the things you should do. And if you have a family member who fits into one of those categories, you should be checking in on them and making sure they are following those guidelines. There's something everyone can do to protect the community from COVID-19. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside Tyler Keith, and you are listening to and watching us on civiccentertv.com, Birmingham Area Municipal Access. You can listen to us on 89.3 Lakes FM and 88.1 FM, The Biff. The Oakland County Megacast brought to you with live exciting interviews Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. until noon. And next on the Oakland County Megacast, we are going to switch a little bit and we are going to now talk business as I try to uh, push the buttons over here. So for those watching, I apologize for that. It's hard as you get older because you need glasses, but you you know, you don't want to take them down and put them back on. And anyone over the age of 40 knows how that works. So our next guest went from riding skateboards to selling them. Ben Clark, the owner of People Skate and Snowboard in Kegel Harbor, joins us on the Oakland County Mega Cast. Ben, I live in Kegel Harbor. You guys have an awesome, awesome sto uh, store. How'd you pick that location? Well, um, it was, I guess it was 10 years ago now. Um, I worked at a different store that uh, was going to close um, called TWC. They had been around, I think it was about 20 years. Um, uh, you know, as a manager and a buyer. And um, when they were going to close, I thought I could make a go of it. So I uh, located in Kego Harbor, where TWC originally was, uh, not in the same location, but in the same city. Um, and it helped me maintain, you know, the customer base that we had grown and, and I had known for at least six years. And, um, you know, kind of that was that was really the push that made made me pick Kego Harbor. So Ben, Skateboarding isn't just an exercise, it's a culture, it's a community. Talk a little bit about that and how important it is to have a local business owner who knows the product in which they're selling. So yeah, I mean, um, I, think, I think that's important of all specialty retail, um, which, which I think when we're talking business right now is, is gonna be um, of primary concern. Um, it's, it's very important to be involved uh, personally, I, I believe. Um, and, and I guess the reason is is uh, you, you get a different sense of, of the sport and the community involved. Um, you know, being present at the skateboard park, uh, whether it's Drake Sports Park or going downtown to Riverside uh, Skate Park in Detroit or, uh, you know, right, there's tons now, they're popping up everywhere. But, uh, but it's really important to have that face time with, uh, with with the community, with cust potential customers too, and existing customers, um, you get to talk about different things in a more candid um, environment. I guess you know when you're in a retail store, it's it's a bit of a different experience. Um, we do talk about a lot of things in the store, but but I think um, me being involved and actively out there, uh, it, it's just it's it's different. I mean, over the years, you'll see um, kids light up and say, "Hey, you're the guy." at the store that helped me get the skateboard. And, uh, you know, I, I think, especially when they're younger, um, they, they definitely get a little starstruck, um, which is nice because I'm, I'm a decent skateboarder, but I'm certainly not the best one there usually. Um, and uh, it, that, that, that involvement um, is, is really important. It also um, kind of helps nail down um, their, their commitment to skateboarding. It makes it seem special. Um, you know, when, when you get to interact with the person who sold you your first skateboard outside of the skateboard store, 
um, that there's just there's something about that that makes you light up. Um, or if they if they know, hey, that guy's on uh, people skating snowboards like skateboard team, you know, they're, they're aware of these things. Um, skateboarding has as a culture definitely has kind of like your big pro stars, but there, there's definitely um, local stars too, in a sense. I, I mean, they would they would hate me saying that, but <laughs> but when the kids see them and they, they light up, you can tell that they really look up to them. Um, so skate, what's, what's interesting, you kind of asked about skateboarding as a culture. What's interesting about that is that um, we don't have as formalized of leagues or instruction base or, or anything like that. So it's a very, um, I guess, uh, not vertically oriented uh, social structure. So in that, um, you know, you see someone who's a really good skateboarder and you can go up to them and say, hey, how did you do that trick? Um, how did, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out how to ollie. I'm trying to figure out how to get from this part of the park to the next part of the park. It's it's very much um, welcoming of that because it, it's not like we're all, we've all gone to some formalized uh, instruction or, or anything like that. It, it, we learn from each other. So we are speaking with Ben Clark. He's the owner of People Skate and Snowboard in Kegel Harbor. As this pandemic wears on, we are seeing more and more people take advantage of being outside. Now that your doors have been able to reopen, are your sales picking up or how is that looking for you? So for us, sales have always been quite good. Um, we're not really, I, I think this is true of all outdoor specialty retail that I'm aware of. Um, we're really not seeing um, a hit, so to speak. Um, I'm not going to say it's not, it doesn't present a bunch of challenges and differences and things that we you know hope hope to get over sooner than later. Um, but in terms of sales, um, things are things are really level or up. Um, so you know it's that that's been really nice. Um, skateboarding is one of those activities that you can generally well you really can participate no matter what. There was a period in time where the skateboard parks closed down, but um, that order has since been lifted um, and people are being respectful at the skateboard parks about distancing as good as they can. I mean, just as good as trail users or, or anything like that. Um, you know, you get people who are doing a better job than others, but you try to just be respectful and keep your space of everyone, you know, away from everyone. Um, so so I, I don't remember when we were allowed to open parks back up, but I think that was up to the municipalities generally. Um, it wasn't really like an executive orders necessarily uh, that, that closed them down, but the municipalities elected to close them down, I want to say until about June. Um, but I mean, anyone who wants to go skateboarding can just simply go outside of their house and, you know, any any neighborhood road or, uh, or smooth surface is, is adequate for skateboarding. So I will say, uh, I look at some of these skateboarders, fearless comes to mind. They are fearless. Even in my neighborhood, which is right behind your shop, kids are out on their skateboards, two, three years old. How do you foster this sport and do you consider it a sport and kids at a very young age? I think, I think for function's sake, I consider it a sport. Um, I, I think it's a it's quite a bit different than than other sports. Um, there there certainly are sports out there that uh, that I would say are more similar. You know, I, I would say like gymnastics and figure skating, things like that, uh, from a sports perspective, are similar. Uh, but skateboarding has its own like kind of rules to it. Um, so that's where things get a little bit more interesting. Uh, that's where I think that that culture comes in where, where there's a lot of skateboarders who don't like to identify it as a sport because we just, we don't have the, the, the structure that, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are some skateboard competitions, but the vast majority of people are not trying to get into a competition. Um, so to compare that to like baseball, it, it's radically different. I mean, every game you play is a competition. Um, you know, you, you basically get into it with the idea that you're competing with skateboarding you know that's more internal some people are extremely competitive for sure but for the most part um you're, you're kind of competing against yourself you're competing against physics and gravity um you know you you say <laughs> it's funny you say skateboarders are fearless um there are some that are for sure but and especially the younger ones but once you take enough falls you, you learn fear it definitely skateboarding teaches you fear <laughs> um it 
I, I try not to fall every day I go out. I do fall a lot, but you know, that's, uh, that's something I'm trying to avoid as hard as I possibly can. <laughs> Uh, so it's, I, I don't know. It's, it's interesting to think of it as fearless. Um, and, I, and I do get from the outsider's perspective, it seems fearless. But I think a lot of the time we're quite fearful. We're just working within uh, the tools we have and uh, kind of an assumption that we physically can, can do what we're trying to, to complete. So it, it's interesting to think about uh, fearlessness in skateboarding. So, Ben, you mentioned that the pandemic didn't necessarily hurt your sales or your ability to continue sales like it had many other businesses, but everybody had to pivot and change how they were operating yeah. in some way or another. How did people skate and snowboard modify its day-to-day -day operations during the bulk of the pandemic when things were not as open as they are right now? Sure. Well, since we're a very small operation, um, I was basically able to just kind of take over every task um, for a couple months. So I was working a lot. Um, we, we have an online store, peopleskateshop.com or peopleskateandsnowboard.com. That was definitely supplementing the sales. Uh, it, it was really nice to have that uh, built out and, and ready to go. Um, you know, that's something I've always been trying to grow. It just, it, because I had put a lot years of effort into it, we were in a good position to still be able to sell things. Um, we were doing, you know, curbs, curbside pickups for, for a period um, so people could order on our website and, and select curbside pickup, which they still can if, if it makes them more comfortable. We're certainly happy to do it that way. Um, but, you know, that was a, that was a big pivot. Um, basically, most of my time went from doing in-store tasks to then moving on to making sure our website was as up-to-date as possible, which is an incredible amount of work for one person. So that's that was my pivot. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, not just skateboards are in your store. You also have a very popular clothing line. It's very, it's brand specific for people in the skateboard community. Can you tell us more about how you pick and choose what you're selling and that side? Because I believe, did your wife help you in that area as well? Yeah. So my wife went to Wayne State for fashion design and merchandising, and she's very comfortable on a sewing machine. Um, we certainly, uh, when that was that was actually a pivot that I wasn't thinking about, but we started making face masks, um, like two layer cotton face masks, and came up or she came up with a bunch of different designs, um, and we kind of picked one we liked best. We we were making those for quite some time. We might still continue to make those, um, but we've been a little bit more in summer mode and, and trying to enjoy vacationing. Um, but, uh, but so the process that we kind of go through with that is it tends to be, we try to make it quarterly. So we kind of like have a big project that, you know, or, or maybe like a design concept uh, that, that we come up with every quarter. Um, and then we also try to uh, make sure we have popular like screen printed shirts that people like. Um, one of our most popular graphics certainly is our milk jug logo. Um, that's, it, it's basically a jug that just says people on it. Um, and, uh, that was created by Matt Hebert, who's another, a local artist. Um, it, it basically, we kind of pulled it off of the skateboard deck that he did. It was our first skateboard deck and we were actually making, um, it, they were milk jugs. So they said milk rather than people on the jug. And, uh, we, we've, I think we printed a bunch of those stickers and then we're handing them out. Um, and people started kind of identifying them as local street art, these milk jugs that were popping up uh, on on things. Uh, so that, for whatever reason, really stuck. Um, it's funny, you design so much stuff, uh, you come up with so many concepts, and the ones that you don't expect sometimes are the ones that just work the best, and that one really did work the best. So when you see um, you know, a big milk jug on the back of people that say people, <laughs> that, that's our that's our brand. So we are talking with Ben Clark, owner of People Skate and Snowboard, located in Kegel Harbor, Michigan. You were a sociology major. During mm -hmm. COVID-19, people are having to reinvent themselves. What advice would you give to someone if they are finding themselves at a crossroads during the pandemic and they wanna follow their passion? Do you have advice for them on how to make a business work? Sure. Um, 
yeah, <laughs> it's it's layers for sure. I I definitely say this is a great time to give it a go because this it's uh, you know in these radical shakeups that we're experiencing right now, um, people are um, in a in a better position to to kind of follow their dream or, or their passion or give something a shot. Um, it's uh, it's just a lot of work. I mean that that's the thing that I think makes a business work is hours and hours put in um, having a strong enough concept that you can uh, really pump your time into it and and uh, you know make make it work um, our because we're meeting through zoom and we're doing different things like that your day-to-day -day schedule changes um, when it comes to starting a business whether it's online or uh, I guess it would be easier to start it online right now but in person potentially too depending on it um, you 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 have you, i don't know you have an ability to set your own schedule so i that's what i love about being an entrepreneur and, and being in business for myself is that i have flexibility um though our stores open uh, monday through saturday noon to six right now and sunday noon to five um i have i have employees and flexibility that that let me um whether it's work on our, our line or write orders um you, you kind of can schedule yourself how you want to um, so I guess when it comes to opening a business in COVID time, um, it's, it, I think it, it provides a really good opportunity. So I would say, you know, seize it. Ben Clark here on the Oakland County Mega, Co Mega Cast with Tyler and myself. Ben, just before we let you go, I want to also mention that you are a member of the Sylvan Lake, uh, the uh, Silver Lake City Council. So can you mm -hmm. talk about that and how has this been to be a member of council during a COVID crisis? That's been a greater challenge probably than most of the other things, though it's for less hours of the week. Um, Cause it's, you know, uh, it's, it's not like it's my whole job or anything, but it's, uh, it's been really hard to have Zoom meetings and try to get uh, public comments and trying to get, um, a feel for for where the community's at. Um, the Zoom meetings are, aren't doing it. <laughs> uh, we're trying. We're trying our best, but we have we have issues that we have to take care of and and move forward as a city. Um, so it's been the Zoom thing has been difficult. I mean, I this this is fun. This works great. Um, but when you have people who really need to hear uh, good reasons for um, for why why maybe we're making a decision that we're making it's very difficult to communicate that through zoom um you know what with, with the hand raising and um people not knowing how to unmute themselves or mute themselves but <laughs> that technological barrier in our city has been has been definitely difficult um and, and caused a lot of frustration so um we're really just doing our best to try to be transparent i'm constantly outside walking around uh, skateboarding um you know i hope residents are willing to come and, and talk to me because that's really the best way to communicate decisions we're making in government. Ben Clark with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Uh, last question, anything that you want to add that you want people to know before we uh, let you go? I mean, not really. Like, you know, just come in, see me, have a conversation. <laughs> we're at, uh, I guess we're at 3375 Orchard Lake Road, which is at, um, Commerce and Orchard Lake. So, um, you know, experience skateboard culture. Uh, a big part of that is is going into the skateboard shop and having a conversation, whether you're just looking at stickers or you're trying to buy a skateboard or you're buying nothing and you just kind of want to check the place out. Um, I think you'll, you'll be surprised and, and feel very welcome in there. Thank you so much for being with us. Ben Clark, owner of People Skate and Snowboard in Kegel Harbor. We're going to take a quick Break. And when we come back, we are hitting outer space. What does that all that mean? Find out on the Oakland County Megacast. This may seem uncomfortable, but so is being hooked to an IV, sleeping in a hospital bed, and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, comfort is not as important as saving lives. Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan, every time you leave home. Hi, 
My name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Park's COVID-19 help hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Good morning, I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside Tyler Keith on the Oakland County Megacast. You can watch and listen to us on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, or you can listen to us on 89.3 Lakes FM and 88.1 FM, The Biff, here on the Oakland County Megacast, where Monday through Friday from 10 until noon, we bring you exciting interviews from people from throughout our community and next we are going to be talking to a west bloomfield high school grad who reached for the sky and found success in space dr kyle helson assistant research scientist at the university of maryland and he works at nasa although we are having slight issues right now trying to get our nasa visitors so what we are going to do instead is we are going to do Quick headlines. This is, you know what? We're all going through this right now. Oh, yeah. Everyone, you're seeing it on TV stations. My husband does the sports cast from our home. These things happen. It's happening in schools. It's happening at meetings. And you just have to roll with the punches. So in the meantime, what we're going to do is just go ahead and uh, give you a quick update on the latest news headlines. And so if you head over to Civic Center TV, each and every morning, we do go ahead and we update the headlines for you. The Democratic National Convention kicked off Monday night. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer was one of the first speakers network television picked up. Whitmer had about five minutes of speaking time in which she mostly focused on the coronavirus crisis. It wasn't her speech at the podium that sent social media a buzz though. Prior to her national televised speech, the governor was caught in a hot mic moment saying, it's not just Shark Week, but Shark Week blank. And we cannot say that word no. here on the uh, mega cast, but really Michigan getting a lot of attention at the Democratic National Convention because the elections are drawing near. I still think that we are going to be a big battleground state. Oh, we absolutely are. It's going to be a huge battleground state, Ronnie, uh, as it was in 2016. And uh, having Governor Whitmer speak last night well, it was really interesting, really good to see to see our state be represented uh, on that national scale. We're going to see it again tonight when uh, Representative Mari Manugin, who we've had on this show multiple times, will be speaking at, I believe, 9 p.m. at the Democratic National Convention. Also making news on Civic Center TV, Michigan may sue federal government over the post service delays. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer's administration is exploring ways to sue the federal government over United States Postal Service delays. Some say could impact the November election. Whitmer's administration is in discussion with other states about a multi-state lawsuit to ensure that the U.S. Postal Service is aggressive in its efforts to ensure that absentee ballots are delivered to local clerk's offices in time to be counted. Tyler, yeah, this is a big issue. It is, and it's absolutely critical that these, that these uh, ballots get to the clerks on time, that they are counted, because we saw in the primaries that we, as you got down to the wire, local clerks, even our county clerk Lisa Brown, had been, it, had been uh, urging residents to not mail their ballots in at all, but physically take them directly to their local clerk's office, whether it be dropping them in the ballot drop boxes that, that were set up at a lot of these city and, and town hall and village halls, or to bring them directly into the clerk's office and deliver them directly to the clerk or to a deputy clerk because of these mail issues. And a lot of these states have, have, vote, have had the population vote in the ability to vote by absentee ballot with no reason. Michigan is one of those states, and so this is a right that's been voted on by the people. 
Also making news this morning, concerns grow as college students return to campuses. No surprise here. Students are beginning to arrive at university campuses throughout Michigan for the fall term. So too are there college parties and dorm life that could spread COVID-19. Central Michigan University in Mount Pleasant just celebrated its welcome weekend. A picture posted in the school newspaper shows at least one large gathering without masks and with little social distancing. University officials across the state have been working diligently to try to come up with measures and put them in place to try to safely return students to campus. Tyler, at the end of the day, this is going to require the students to follow those measures and those guidelines, but we are talking about college students. Yeah, the measures and the guidelines are for on campus, for in the classroom, for walking around between classes, for on campus facilities. But what's gonna be even more important is what these students do off campus and when they're not in class, when they're not walking around and when they're on their own time because that's when they're setting their own rules, that's when they're setting their own guidelines and they have to do their part in our society to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. So as much as great as these regulations are and as necessary as they are for these college campuses, the real test isn't really made on campus or, or in the classroom in this, in this scenario. It's made outside the classroom, in the dorms, in the apartments and at parties and so on on college campuses. So we've already seen the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, they had started classes on campus they had an outbreak of COVID-19, so now they're going back to remote learning. And I think we're going to see that happen more and more as the universities get the kids back on the college campuses. I know my nephew went back this uh, past weekend. My niece is going to be starting U of M. I believe they go back on the 31st. So college campuses are trying this, but at the end of the day, a lot of this is about money, you know? Yeah, it is about money, and these, these colleges want to have students back on campus. They want to have them back in the dorms. They're making money off of, of living expenses, off of tuition, of course, off of uh, food services, and especially with sports, being, with sports being out. Now, the ACC for North Carolina isn't out just yet of cash crop sports such as, uh, such as football, but on a lot of other campuses that's not the case and they're going to do whatever they can to continue to bring those revenue that revenue back in so our last headline this morning new coronavirus cases continue to plateau in michigan i guess this is a little bit of good news that we are seeing here in the state michigan added 465 new cases of coronavirus and one death on monday this brings the state's total COVID 19 cases to 93,185. the number of deaths stands at 6,325. The lower daily count of the virus is in stark contrast to last week when the number of cases trended upward to an average of 700. Now the state did attribute the high number of daily cases to larger than usual test returns. And we are seeing that there is a bit of a delay at some of the labs, but you can find those stories and more on civiccentertv.com where we put all of the news COVID-19 related to help you navigate this pandemic. We are going to take a quick break and when we come back we are going to try to connect with our guest and uh, I think he has a lot of cool things he wants to share with you so stay with us. The Megacast will be right back. Hi I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water and step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 
1-800-273-5533 to learn more. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so, those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Good morning, I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside Tyler Keith on the Oakland County Mega Cast. You're listening to us on 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake, 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills, and we welcome you back to the Oakland County Mega Cast. Had a little bit of a technical issue earlier, but we are going to go back and bring in our guest. He's a West Bloomfield High School grad who reached for the sky, found success in space. Sorry, Kyle, I had to write that. Come on. He's an assistant research scientist at the University of Maryland. He also works at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. We want to go ahead and bring in Dr. Kyle Helson to the Oakland County Megacast. Good morning. Good morning. How's it going? It's great here in West Bloomfield. I have to say, I thought it was so cool when I pulled up your profile and you had an email that said NASA.com. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's kind of it's kind of s- surreal still sometimes that like I can say that I work at NASA and things like that because I don't think I don't think if you would ask me like you know like 20 years ago if I thought this is where I would be so it's kind of cool. So talk a little bit about your path. How did you go from West Bloomfield High School to where you are today? Yeah, sure. So I yeah, like I said, I I went through I graduated from West Bloomfield High School. I went to Scotch Elementary and Abbott Middle School. Um, when I was a kid, I always really liked science and math, and I ended up taking you know a lot of science and math classes in high school, and I took like some AP classes and things like that. And then by my junior year of high school, I took a class called C squared, which I don't know if it still exists anymore, but it was um, uh, Fornell and Mr. Fornell and, and Mrs. Fortunate taught that when I was in at, at West Bloomfield. And it was a combination of pre-calculus and physics. And that is kind of when I really decided that I really liked physics and that I wanted to do more of it. And then my senior year of high school, I took AP physics uh, with Mr. Barclay and I took AP calculus with, uh, Mr., with Dr. Brandel now. Um, and then that kind of cemented my desire to major in physics in college. And so I went to Case Western Reserve University, which is in Cleveland, Ohio. I did a physics, a four-year physics degree there. Um, And actually when I was in college is when I started to do uh, research. And so as a sophomore, the summer after my sophomore year of college, I worked in a lab in at Case Western over the summer. So instead of like coming home and and lifeguarding and doing, or working in a store, waiting tables or something like that, I stayed on campus and got to work with graduate students and a professor and and a postdoc who were at case doing cosmology research and that's kind of how i got into it and i'm a little bit rare in the sense that i the, the lab that i worked in as an undergraduate was also like cosmology instrumentation research work and i'm still doing that to today like a lot of times you'll find people who try a whole sorts of different research fields um But I really like what I do with instrumentation. I think it's a lot of fun. And so I did that in college and then I met some graduate students. And that's when I first kind of realized that going to graduate school and getting a PhD in physics was possible. And that was like a a semi viable career path. Um, And so from there, I during my senior year, like end of junior towards senior year of college, I applied to graduate schools 
and I ended up getting into uh, Brown University, which is in Providence, Rhode Island, and I did a physics PhD at Brown, and that took another six years. So for people <laughs> keeping track at home, that's another 10 years after, after high school. Uh, I'm still in school. I graduated in 2016, and then I got a postdoc fellowship to work at NASA Goddard, and then after that, I sort of I spent two years as a postdoc, which is kind of this in between position where you've finished with a PhD, you're still earlier in your career, but you're not uh, you don't have like the the full resume to like apply to some of these fancier positions. And so I spent two years as a postdoc working at Goddard, and then I got to be able to switch over to being a contract scientist through the University of Maryland. So that's where I am now. So even though my employer is the University of Maryland, all of my normal in like non-pandemic day-to-day work is at Goddard. Um, and for people who aren't familiar, Goddard Space Flight Center is in uh, Greenbelt, Maryland, which is just east of College Park, Maryland. So for people who know where the University of Maryland is, or if you're familiar with where Washington, D.C. is, we're like 15 miles-ish outside of downtown D.C. We are talking with Dr. Kyle Helson. He's the assistant research scientist at the University of Maryland. And NASA Goddard Space Flight Center is where he is working. He came, started his path to his career at the West Bloomfield High School. He is a native who is on this new path, this new journey. Tell us what your job is like and in a normal day to day and then how has it changed during COVID-19? Sure. So my normal day to day would be working in a research lab with anywhere between two and 10 other people, depending on the day. Um, and what my group primarily builds is instrumentation for infrared through kind of like radio wave telescopes. So we want to build new detectors or new pieces of the of telescopes like filters or lenses and things like that. So we want to essentially the goal is to do research now and then hope that the technologies and tools that we develop today will end up in a future spaceflight mission in 5, 10, 20 years, something like that. So um, some of you may be familiar with some of the current space telescopes that we have, like Hubble or James Webb, well, all that stuff that went into that project when it went up into space, I guess James Webb hasn't gone into space yet, but for Hubble, for example, it was 30 years ago, all that technology had to be well-established and developed long before the flights. And so NASA is constantly both trying to build the next generation uh, space instruments as well as working on new technologies that they want to mature along the way to get ready to go into space in the future dr helson we do dr yeah. helson really interesting work that you that you're doing and and that you're a part of with built with helping to build these new instruments that 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 essentially build the next generation of space exploration for for nasa and for the united states of america and with, with that being the case what do these new telescopes bring or these new technologies bring to the overall landscape of exploring space that that change over time so the biggest thing for us is that if you study astrophysics and cosmology everything that you want to study is really 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 far away so if it's really 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 far away and you're trying to measure really faint light or pick take pictures of really really distant objects you want really, really sensitive instruments. So you want to be able to collect as much light as possible. You want to have as little noise as possible. You want to have as high of a signal to noise ratio. For some of you may be familiar with that term, or you want to have a really, really um, well understood instruments that like you can use to their full extent. Like the other problems that you see a lot is like you, you may, may people may have heard that in the early 90s, they launched the Hubble Space Telescope, and then it had to be fixed because the lenses in it were slightly out of focus. So for example, you all those lenses and filters and things, you can't just go to the store and like buy them off the shelf. Like They're all custom made, designed by scientists and engineers at NASA or at some of the universities that we partner with. 
Um, so all of it is like building everything from scratch, basically. So you want to build the next, like in this, in the sort of in the same way that you went from having like a flip phone, like 20 years ago to having a smartphone to today, if you can imagine if you couldn't go to the store and buy those and had to start over every time and, and work to develop the most, the newest technology based on what you learned building that oldest technology. I like your analogy there. The flip phone one I can relate to. So we are speaking <laughs> with Dr. Kyle Helson. He's the assistant research scientist at the University of Maryland. What do you think the future for space travel is going to be like? Will we be able to, you know, just hop on the uh, the spacecraft and go out like the Jetsons? You know, is that going to be our future? That, that's a good question. So I think, unfortunately, because of the way that gravity works, space travel will always be very expensive. Um, to put into perspective, uh, it's usually quoted that like in order to put a satellite or an object or a person or a space station or something in orbit around the Earth, it costs about $12,000 a pound. So you can work out the math. Well, if it's $12,000 a pound to put a satellite in orbit, well, then what does... Uh, a family of four, a holiday for a family of four costs to get you up and around the the earth it, well it's, it's like hundreds of thousands of dollars right like um it's it's because earth's gravity is so strong and because you have to travel such a great distance directly fighting gravity it's always going to take a lot of fuel so i think it will really only ever be available for like leisure travel for people who are really 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 wealthy <laughs> unfortunately um that being said i think that travel to other planets in the solar like the nearest two planets either venus or mars not that you would ever want to go to actually venus because uh, the atmosphere there is terrible and nothing we've sent there has survived for more than like an hour or so but um like for human sending humans to mars i think certainly is possible but i don't think it will ever be a viable uh opportunity for people who are not either astronauts or probably extremely wealthy, fortunately. Oh. So it, it, space travel is so fascinating in itself. How do you inspire or what do you, hi, kitty, kitty, kitty. <laughs> I see yeah, you have a little our, uh, friend there. What's your cat's yeah, name? This is Kelvin. He's a, uh, he's a brand new kitten. We've had him for a couple of weeks. He's uh, exploring the office right now. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's okay. We're all going through it. So yeah. what would you say to a young kid who's interested in outer space? They look to the sky, they see the stars, and they dream. What words of advice would you give them? I would say always be curious and, like, don't be afraid to ask questions. Like, even if you, like, I think, unfortunately, a lot of times people worry that they're going to ask, like, dumb questions or something like that. I don't think that's really, uh, like, a fair characterization. Like, I think... If it's a if it's a question that you want to know the answer to, like you should definitely ask or try to find the answer. Um, and I also think that there is there is something to be said for being persistent. Like I I don't think anyone can come out of like doing a PhD or or getting somewhere in research and say like oh that was super easy. Like it's never super easy. Like you're always going to face obstacles. Like one of the really difficult parts about doing basic research like I do and and like so many other people um, at NASA do is that there usually isn't a right answer. Like, unfortunately, unlike school where you can look up the right answer to this algebra problem or, or what have you, um, a lot of times there isn't a right answer. So you, you kind of have to be um, willing to try things on your own, you know, and be persistent and, and try to figure out what the best, the best answer is. And so, um, yeah, I think being, being persistent and asking questions uh, can get you pretty far. Dr. Helson, um, it, uh, Dr. Helson, space exploration, the work that NASA does and the scientific research that uh, the universities associated with NASA does, it changes over time. What do you imagine uh, as we head in, as we head years down the road will be some of the more some of the more up and coming research avenues that maybe young science enthusiasts can focus on now or begin focusing on now as a possible career path down the line? Sure. So I think probably people imagine that NASA, you know, really focuses on like human space flight or, or studying studying the you know the universe and and galaxies and stuff like that. And that's true. But NASA also does a lot of other research. Like a lot of my 
uh like so i at goddard like twelve thousand people work there like it's actually one of the biggest nasa facilities and we do science ranging from studying exoplanets which are these really cool you know pretty new field like these these all we've discovered hundreds and, and hundreds of planets that exist outside of our own solar system and so that's becoming a really big new field um we've also really sort of um flown under the radar i think on this a little bit but nasa does a lot of like climate and earth science research so studying the atmosphere and earth and improving our atmospheric and climate models is really important and i think that's going to become more important and also kind of like we hinted before talking about all of those other elements to human space flight say if we want to go to mars like okay well then there's there's going to be a lot of actually like botany and agriculture research required to do that because now you're talking about getting people to go a really far distance and that requires food that requires water things like that and so maybe something that people don't traditionally think of as being like research for nasa nasa is actively pursuing and i think the farther away that we travel from earth the more <clears throat> excuse me the more and more important that doing this kind of agriculture and, and sort of uh, like biology or botany research is going to be uh, important as well. We're speaking with Dr. Kyle Helson, assistant research scientist at the University of Maryland, and he works at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He is a West Bloomfield High School grad, hashtag super smart, but I am going to uh, shift a little bit and I see that you have your bike hanging behind you. Yeah. You're an avid cyclist. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I started riding bikes when I was in graduate school. So I, sorry. Yeah. yeah uh, the congressional. Uh, just our apologies there. We have our next zoom guest that has hopped on and uh, we just got to get her muted real quick. Let's um, just see. Go ahead, Dr. Helson. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I, so I, when I was in graduate school at Brown, I started riding bikes with the Brown cycling team there. And so I went from being a competitive swimmer. So I swam all the way in middle school, high school, all the way through college. And then after that, I kind of wanted to try something else and find a different sort of thing to do to keep me busy when I'm not at work and things like that. So um, I started riding bikes. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm a competitive cyclist. So, well, not right now. There's uh, not a lot of racing and events going on right now, given the, the pandemic, but certainly in, in times when there, there are events to go to, yeah, I'll definitely, um, I, I, I race, yeah, I race primarily on the track. So, um, in Michigan, for example, there's a, there's a velodrome in Rochester Hills, and there's also one in downtown Detroit. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, let me ask, I think the Tour de France is going to be starting up here at the end of the month or in August. Uh, yeah, it's in like 10 days. Yeah, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting because this is super late. I, usually it happens in July. And so it's definitely going to be hotter. Um, and obviously people have had a completely different um, sort of season training and things like that. Like it, it'll be interesting what happens kind of like with every other major sport that we can watch now where the seasons are totally different. And there's this extra element of like what teams were able to cope the best with the pandemic and things like that. So yeah, I'll be, I'll be watching for sure. And I'm talking with my friends and things like that. There's, there's been, um, this whole past couple of weeks, there's been a pretty big return to like the professional bike racing scene in, in Europe. And so, um, there's been a lot, just like the return to watching hockey and basketball and things like that and baseball, uh, cycling is no different in that regard. Well, we thank you so much for being with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Dr. Kyle Helson, a West Bloomfield High School graduate, showing all of us when you reach for the stars, you find them. So we are going to uh, take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast. And when we come back, we'll be speaking with Representative Brenda Carter on the Megacast. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water and step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. 
for handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so. Those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside Tyler Keith, where you can watch us on CivicCenterTV.com, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, or listen to us on 89.3 Lakes FM and 88.1 FM, the Biff. And so we are going to shift gears just a little bit. Our elected leaders really have been vital during the COVID-19 crisis. We want to go ahead and bring in Representative Brenda Carter. She represents the 29th district, which of course covers our area here, Auburn Hills, Kegel Harbor, Orchard Lake, Pontiac, and Sylvan Lake. Thank you so much for being with us again on the Oakland County Megacast. Thank you again for having me. You are always such a wealth of knowledge for our listeners as well as for our viewers. What is some of the latest news that you can share with us at this time? Of course, everyone should be aware now that a return to learn package was passed yesterday in the House of Representatives. Actually, it was passed by the House that went over the Senate for tweaking, and then it came back to the House yesterday. And there was bipartisan support as well as bipartisan dissent. Uh, these bills uh, really as a pro for our teachers. It, it, it gives them a little extra funding to help them do their jobs, which is much appreciated. But it also uh, did not have our stakeholders at the table. There were several uh, amendments that was done to this package by the Education Committee chaired by Minority Leader Darren Camilleri, but uh, these bills passed, um, like I said, it was not unanimous. And uh, I'm sure there's going to be work to do with them to make sure that our superintendents, our ISD superintendents, as well as our local superintendents and our principals have the tools and the resources they need to start school safely. Uh, this is the one concern that we had on the education committee because there were little hidden things inside the package that really could be a hindrance to our administrators as they attempt to do their jobs. But uh, as it stands right now, we do have a uh, plan to roll forward to start school. I must say with the Oak Oakland County, Oakland County ISD, of the 28 school districts that were um, in, in, Oakland, in Oakland ISD, 25 of them decided to open schools virtually. And that's largely because of the resurgence of the COVID vi virus. So I'm, I'm glad to know that uh, under the leadership of Wanda Cook Robinson, that we are taking our, the safety of our children, not only our children, but their parents and their grandparents in account to what we do as we roll out a plan to open up our schools. So as we get into the school year, I know that this bill gives them additional financial support. Is that going to be enough to get them through this pandemic, do you think? Or are they going to need more going forward? Well, I think 
you know, that we should keep a pulse on this simply because as we stand right now, from what I'm hearing from the superintendents is that they do not have the budgetary needs that they can, that is needed to even open up the school district safely. So I would think that we would look at this, you know, frequently to see whether or not we are supplying our school districts with what they need. So you represent a district that is very diverse. How do you address concerns in one area that may be different to a different area? Well, one of the things I took into account early is to get my superintendents together, uh, the superintendent of West Bloomfield Schools, the superintendent of Avondale Schools, and the superintendent of Pontiac Schools to find out there is a lot of things they have in common. And they are, I believe they're working collaboratively. This is the way it appears to be. Uh, uh, working with Oakland County that they have regular superintendent meetings where they look across the board and see where the highs and the lows are and what they can do to support each other. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident that the superintendents in my district are talking to each other and working together to provide the resources that they need. I have to say once again, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to provide them what they need at the time that they need it because we have uh, for unfortunately got to this point where we are uh, making a plan available what right before school starts so you know we're once again the education committee is keeping a pulse on this to see what our superintendents need what our educators need what our essential workers are and I'd like to talk about them for a minute because they're they're not really noted in the equation of what I'm seeing we have bus drivers we have cafeteria workers even though the children will be uh, remote up until I think it's um, November, but we have cafeteria workers, sanitation workers, all of these workers that are, uh, are important to the structure of our school districts, and they need to be taken into account as well. So, you know, I'm hoping that this is an ongoing open discussion in the legislature where we can critique these um, uh, anomalies as they happen and provide our school systems with what they need. Representative Carter, the upcoming elections and the and the uh, onset of more absentee voting has been a recurring issue since the August primary, and it will continue to be as we approach November. You were at a, an event today in support of the post office. Can you talk a little bit about that about that event? Yes, this is an event, and I'm here right now. Uh, con all actually, our congressional leaders, Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence, Congresswoman uh, Rashida Tlaib, Congresswoman Haley Stevens, and Congressman Dan Kildee are here at the post office in support of postal workers. Uh, it's more than just the election at stake right here. You know, for our seniors who need their medicines, their medications, this is a slowdown, potentially hazardous situation for them if they do not get insulin in time or the insulin is spoiled. For our, 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 our constituents who get social security checks or any type of uh, uh, check that comes from through the mail, anything that comes through the mail, even just basic school supplies. So, and not to mention how this is, in my opinion, something that attacks a, a, a historic institution. I'm a former postal worker, so you know my heart's here. I introduced a piece of legislation yesterday to protect our postal workers and the, oh, so many of them that are just here and they're trying to do their jobs and some of the political things that's going on right now is a, not only a hindrance to postal workers, but a hindrance to people, all, all people. You know, so we need to protect this institution. And this is what I believe our congressional leaders are out here exposing to, uh, exposing to right now. There have been issues with the Postal Service for several years now. There's been financial concerns. How do you propose to fix that? And secondly, how in the world did this become so political? The first one first, um, you know, they're looking, I know that our congressional leaders are going back to Washington to uh, introduce some legislation and get the inspector general involved to look at this to see whether or not this is legal and come up with solutions, most importantly, to fix this. I'm not sure if we own the state 
state level can't do anything other than write a resolution, which I did yesterday in support of the uh, uh, post, postal system. But on the congressional level, I know that they're 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 digging in deep. Senator Gary Peters is actually working, actually spearheading some of the things that they want to put in place. So I'm I'm hoping to hear some good things from our congressional leaders. You know, I was hoping to hear it out there, but this interview was much too important. And the second question was, tell me again. How did the postal service become such a hot button political issue? Okay, and this is just my assertion on this. Um, the fact that uh, this is a very, very important election. And right now with COVID-19 attacking a lot of our uh, uh, constituents nationwide, it's become a hazard to go to be in public. We're, we're uh, told to wear masks. We're told, told to the social distance. I know that a lot of people are very passionate on both sides of the aisle to vote and have their candidate get in. But by mitigating ways to get to the post office, ways to vote, because a lot of states are, are uh, instituting mail-in uh, voting, no, no excuse absentee voting. But the bottom line of it is, is that I think it's, in my opinion, it's a form of voter suppression, but it's going to have serious consequences because too many people have depended on the postal system so long. It's, it's just another form of vote, voter suppression. We're speaking with Representative Brenda Carter on the Oakland County Megacast, sticking to the subject of the Postal Service and the elections right now. Going forward into November, I know one of the things that has come to light here in the state of Michigan was should votes be counted if the ballots are received after that 8 p.m. deadline? A judge has ruled that in the state of Michigan, they have to be in the clerk's office by 8 p.m. Other states do allow them as long as they're postmarked by the close of Election Day. Your thoughts on that? Well, I would like to see uh, the uh, period extended beyond the Election Day because of so many variables that's in place. That's going to make it difficult for our constituents to vote. However, I definitely are going to follow the law. And then if we know if we know for sure that there's nothing we can do to change that, then we have to put systems in place to ensure those uh, constituents who are not able to get to the voting booth, those who are not able to follow the mail-in, that we do everything we can to help them. My, my personal thought is our constitutional right to vote. And if this is being hampered by any reason at this time of uh, uh, COVID-19, the pandemic, we should put systems in place to ensure that every voter is counted. Every single voter is counted. Their voice is heard. So that's, that's my take on that. Representative Brenda Carter with us from Michigan's 29th district on the Oakland County Megacast. And Representative Carter, uh, this week, last night, we heard from Governor Gretchen Whitmer at the Democratic National Convention. Tonight, we're going to hear from another one of our local representatives, one of your constituents, Mari Manugin, will speak at 9 p.m. tonight. Uh, a lot of young, up-and-coming leadership on both sides of the aisle in the state of Michigan. Can you speak to just to the uh, amount of development of our next line of leaders that we are developing here in the state of Michigan? Yes, it's incredible. Mari Manugian is an incredible young woman that gives us hope for the future as far as our Democratic Party. You know, she's not alone. There's uh, Kyra Harris Bolden. There's uh, uh, Laura Pahatsky. There is uh, Sarah Anthony is a superstar. And what I really like about what we're doing in the caucus is that we're taking the time to not only expose but develop these young people so they're ready, putting them right there in the front line, letting them you know, it's an incredible opportunity for uh, Representative Manukian to be able to speak at the Democratic Convention. So I love what we're doing as far as supporting our young people. I'd like to see us reach back into our communities and offer mentoring programs. I'm, I'm going to work with Senator Rosemary Baer. She has a, a program that she's reaching back and mentoring young people and getting them ready for that next step, involving them in the governmental process. And I believe that will take away some of that voter apathy from our 20 to 45 age group by involving them in the governmental process and, and putting them right there. So I think it's absolutely incredible. 
So I know we're only one day into the national convention, but your thoughts on going virtual, how is it working? Is it reaching more people, less people? This is a crazy world right now. Well, I tell you, I am a delegate and uh, it is a uh, uh, there are Zoom meetings everywhere. I'm very proud and glad that I was selected as a delegate. And it's given me the opportunity to look at various different groups or stakeholder groups like our labor group, like our seniors group. Another one that I'm involved in is the poverty group where I work on the poverty and homelessness caucus in the state of Michigan. So it gives me an opportunity to interface with different groups all over the state, find out what their best, best practices are. But I can tell you, honestly, it's quite overwhelming. <laughs> a lot to keep up with, I'm sure. Oh, my God. <laughs> so we're talking with Representative Brenda Carter from Michigan's 29th District. Just a few more minutes here with you on the Oakland County Megacast. Anything from your district that you want to mention or let people know about? Well, my, I would say the 29th district is incredible. Um, in the 18 months that I've been the representative, I had, I've had an opportunity to go and be involved, not only as a representative, but as a, as a colleague, as a, as a, a <laughs> what, you, what you call, just be a part of their world. Orchard Lake Village, uh, Kego Harbor, and so many things they do, like the sandbar, <laughs> okay? Sylvan Lake and their monarch butterfly, the Auburn Hills, and the night theater is just a beautiful, because they're collaborating. I created a room where I put all five mayors, I have five mayors and five city councils, where they can talk to each other. And then this Pontiac, you cannot help but just be proud of what's happening in Pontiac, everything from the M1 concourse to Amazon. So all of these things are being shared back and forth between the five communities. And I hope to make us more cohesive be before I leave office. Right now, I am extremely proud of District 29 and what we are doing and how they have invited me into their worlds and let me share a piece of what they're doing. So real quickly, I believe the last time we spoke with you, there was the effort with some concerts in the parks to try to get the census out there. This has been a hard year to get census returned because with the COVID-19 going door to door, just so many outdoor events have been canceled where normally you would be able to get out and encourage people to fill out the census forms. What's the latest on that effort? Is there a good return? And that's important money. Well, at uh, right now, I believe Pontiac is about 60%, and then Sylvan Lake, to go to the other end, I think there's somewhere over 80, 85% return right now. But the concerts are very, very important because a lot of people are feeling really shut in right now. And I know, give a shout out to Mayor Deirdre Waterman. She, she has uh, repetitively had concerts, virtual concerts, uh, uh, outside of City Hall concerts. She's doing everything she can to make sure that the message get out about the census. There's another group in Pontiac, you know, to bring those numbers up, give it to Raheem Harris and his effort to get the census out, Deonna Patterson. We are working, we're going door, door to door, we're doing everything we can to get that number up. And I'd like to mention to everybody out there, the deadline for completing the census was October 31st. That has been moved up to September 30th. So we have just a little over a month to get those numbers up and get reach our people, but we're doing everything we can. Yes, you're talking about $1,800 a person, which comes, which comes out to $18,000 in 10 years. That's a lot of money in all my districts, please. If you're not at 100%, go for it. Representative Brenda Carter with us on the Oakland County Megacast. The census, it really does take two minutes to fill out yeah. online. They've made it so easy. Take the time to do it. Help your local community. One last topic I want to touch on before we let you leave. I know you're very passionate about the homeless population. At the beginning of COVID-19, we heard a lot about homelessness and this pandemic. There seemed to be an outpouring of support, but lately not a lot of talk going on about the homeless during the pandemic. Anything you want to speak to on that issue? 
Yes, uh, thank you for asking that question because I'm extremely passionate about our homeless community, especially with the eviction moratorium expiring. We hope that we do not see an explosion of homeless cases, but we do have systems in place in District 29, working with the Hope Warman Center, working with the Lighthouse, and, and my own personal issue every week where we put we put together meals and supplies for our homeless community to take care of them on the state level with the COVID-19 obviously has hampered a lot of the things that Senator Bear and I were going to do as a caucus but the governor's poverty caucus is covering a lot of this these these um, uh, uh, events with our homeless, as well as uh, County Executive Dave Coulter, he is he's got a pulse on our homeless environment as well. So I'm I'm feeling pretty confident at this time that our homeless, as it stand right now. We are able to meet their needs. We have a lot of support from the Pontiac Democratic Club, the Oakland County Democratic Black Caucus, as far as taking care of our homeless. But I'm I'm cautiously. I'm cautious about where we're standing with the eviction moratorium expiring and the unemployment expiring. Will that cause a tsunami of homelessness in District 29 where we really could address, we could use more resources? Something for us to continue to watch. Representative Brenda Carter from Michigan's 29th District. We appreciate you taking time away from your event to be with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. We uh, wish you the best uh, this afternoon. Have a good day, and thank you for all the hard work that you've been doing. Well, thank you once again so much for having me anytime. So when we are going to take a quick break here on the Megacast, when we come back, one of the hot issues that everyone is talking about right now, high school sports, what is this going to look like as we move into the fall season? You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart, keep wearing a mask in public, and if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside the one and only Tyler Keith. He is just a mastermind behind the board here and I appreciate and uh, say thank you for all of his help as we try to switch positions here a little bit, just so I can try to expand my knowledge and learn the technical side of this business. Learning something new when you're old, not so easy, Tyler. So uh, we wanna go ahead and spend the last few minutes of the Megacast talking about something that has been such a big, big issue for so many families, so many sports athletes out there. Of course, it's been a chaotic time for the sports world. COVID-19 to blame there, especially high school sports. Last week, hard decision was made by the Michigan High School Athletics Association to put football on hold until spring. We've heard a lot about this. So to talk more about that decision, we're joined by John Johnson. He's the director of broadcast properties with the Michigan High School Athletics Association. John, thank you for joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. Morning, Ronnie. It's a pleasure to be with you today. 
what a hard time for all of these student athletes. Uh, and you can't say it enough. I mean, your your heart goes out for these kids uh, because you know they they all work hard. We know that. Uh, you know, we're all parents uh, in here. We've had kids who have gone through the system or who are in the system. You know, so it's it's not like you know we're operating in a vacuum. As far as knowing, uh, you know, how how kids feel, I think one of the hardest things, uh, Mark Ewell. Our, uh, our executive director had to deal with over the weekend was his son Grant, who was in the running to be the starting quarterback at his high school uh, this fall, and who also lost his junior uh, baseball season. He was a starting catcher on, on his school's baseball team. And so, you know, we've all had kids who have been in the system, and, you know, we know the hard work that they put into it. But, uh, you know, our board, which is made up of uh, 19 uh, school people from around the state, just felt that uh, after taking all of the input that we had gotten through surveys from uh, member schools, that we had gotten uh, in our correspondence with the Department of Health and with the governor's office, that uh, football just bore too much risk, too many unknowns, and uh, made the decision right now to move football to the spring. You know, John, if we can back up here just for a second, can you explain to people out there who aren't familiar with your organization, what exactly is the Michigan High School Athletics Association, how does it work, and who does it cover? Well, we're a uh, private nonprofit organization, a voluntary membership. Uh, School boards uh, have to sign a formal resolution uh, every summer in order to join the MHSAA. At that point, then, they adopt all of the rules in the MHSAA handbook as their own and uh, accept the responsibility for enforcing those rules. And if they do that, then their school teams um, have the privilege to play in tournaments that we have in 28 different sports, 14 for boys and 14 for girls. Uh, We have a 27-member staff that uh, works here in, uh, in the East Lansing office. Uh, we receive no taxpayer dollars, and we have a 19-member board of directors. Uh, we call it the Representative Council. It's made up of uh, people from around the state, uh, different sizes of schools, um, different geographics, public, private. And like I say, we have superintendents, coaches, ADs, principals uh, you know, on this board. And uh, they're the ones that, uh, that do make the votes, and it's up to, up to the staff then to provide them with the input to help make, make those decisions, and then to uh, then assist the schools in their day-to-day administration of school sports. John Johnson with us. He's the director of broadcast properties at the Michigan High School Athletics Association. And, John, football being moved to the spring. We talked with West Bloomfield's high school football coach yesterday, Ron Bellamy, who said that he, he's expecting that with the conflicts potentially with other sports such as track and field and, and lacrosse and so on that are also playing on the turf fields and, and in these stadium areas that he would expect the football season to be shorter in the spring. Is there any word on uh, what we can expect from football then or uh, how, are you gonna, how the MHSAA is going to mix having a, a, a sport that's as involved as football in some of the same facilities as other sports that are also very heavily involved on those fields and tracks? Well, that's, that's a great comment, and it's a great thought, and it's something that obviously we have been working on alternative plans for the spring ever since last spring. You know, what would it look like if something happened and we still had to come up with three seasons because that's what we're committed to? Uh, and what would that do to the calendar? And what that would do to the calendar, of, you know, first of all, is it would push some things in some different directions. Um, we call it spring one and spring two. Uh, what it would amount to is uh, starting some of the winter sports just a little bit earlier, uh, finishing them just a little bit earlier. And then uh, in March, uh, we would have spring one, which is where not just football, but any fall sport that doesn't get uh, that doesn't get played, so you have to consider that uh, even though soccer and volleyball and other sports, you know, we're still looking at uh, trying to get things going with them this week. 
there could be an outbreak. Uh, there could be something where we move back to level three and we can't have sports anymore. Uh, then spring one is where uh, those sports would land. And that would be in a calendar that uh, in football's case would run from maybe the middle of uh, February uh, into playoffs beginning at the end of uh, April. Probably a six to eight week season uh, followed by a playoff. And then, uh, then you would have some overlap like we have already between winter sports and fall sports. There's some overlap as fall sports are concluding their tournaments and spring seasons are starting. Spring seasons will probably to some degree start on time, but by the time you take all the weather into account, you've really minimized uh, some of the conflict that will happen for those multi-purpose fields like West Bloomfield has. Um, and take everything in the spring and just move it back maybe a week, maybe two, not quite getting into July. And, you know, we started looking now at some calendars again to see, okay, how is this gonna fall? How is this gonna play off? And in one of those cases, 75% of the football teams will be finished before uh, spring sports really got into their seasons. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of thought that's going into how do we slide the calendar around? How do we make sure that we have an experience available to all of these kids? John, if one thing we've learned about this virus is COVID-19 is not consistent. The science changes every day. How are you planning for the future not knowing what tomorrow brings? And is there a possibility this whole year in 2021 could just be a bust? You can never rule that out. Colleges are looking at the same things. Pro teams are looking at the same things. Uh, you know, I'm hearing some different things about, uh, you know, the NBA may not get restarted in December, uh, like they've uh, like they've said. Um, you know, so there's a lot of terribly move, you know, fast moving parts. And you just have to be ready to have a plan in place and be ready to turn on a dime if that's what happens. But uh, we've had excellent communication with um, the governor's office, her medical people. Um, you know, we get good input from our schools uh, on all of this. And, you know, there was uh, in our survey, you know, we had a lot of people that said, yeah, I like this, but in a comment section. And uh, when you looked at all of those uh, comments uh, that came in, it saw the uncertainty uh, that was out there. So, you know, so we're going to go ahead and, uh, you know, develop a plan. Hey, this is how we're going to go. And uh, knowing that we may find this out, we may find that out. We may have a situation like that school in Georgia had where, uh, you know, they had over 100 cases and nothing flat and have had to uh, shut things down. University of North Carolina yesterday just went completely online because uh, people got stupid and had all these big parties. And now they've got now they've got major COVID outbreaks. You know, so there's a combination of things in place. It's not just the virus itself, which yes, we don't really know what this virus can do yet. And some decisions have to be made on that. But we have the decisions that we can make, mask up, have personal responsibility, do all the right things that we can do to try to make sure that we can have a season. John Johnson with us. He is the Director of Broadcast Properties at the Michigan High School Athletics Association. And, and John, Previously, a date was set for August 20th for decisions on some fall sports such as football. Of course, last week, Friday, a week before that, the decision was made on football. Any decision that can be expected, uh, positive or negative, about fall participation for volleyball, boys soccer, and other sports coming this week? We're, we're hopeful that uh, tomorrow's meeting of the Representative Council uh, will determine uh, what happens with uh, all of the other sports. We're hopeful of getting some more direction from the governor's office that will get pools open, that will get school gymnasiums open and uh, get volleyball and get girls swimming and diving back on the right path. Looking for some interpretation about how the, how the uh, health people feel about soccer. Uh, you know, questions to be asked about kids playing with masks on in sports like soccer, like in sports like volleyball. Uh, you know, so there, there's a lot that will be addressed uh, tomorrow. We hope to have more input uh, from our sources to help us, uh, to help guide us through those decisions tomorrow. And, uh, you know, late uh, tomorrow afternoon or uh, Thursday morning, uh, we'll be letting people know the direction that things are going to go. Uh, hopefully all of the cards will fall into place. 
One thing that we have learned about this virus from professional sports, testing is key. And while I understand high schools don't have the money that professional organizations have, have there been any talks with the state government and health departments to maybe implement some type of testing program to be able to keep these kids playing? Uh, no testing discussions you know, have, have taken place. That would be something that would be basically directly between schools uh, and state government. Uh, it's not an authority that's been given uh, to the MHSAA because we couldn't order something that uh, can't be, that we can't finance. You know, we won't put an unfunded mandate uh, on our schools. And so I think if you were to start to look at that testing for, uh, for student athletes, I think you'd probably be looking at testing for the general student population as well. Uh, John, just another couple of minutes with you. Anything else that would be important for our audience to know about decisions on sports, about what we can expect for fall, winter, and spring of this year? Well, I think one of the big things that uh, people want to know, are, th are they going to be able to go to games? And uh, that's something else that uh, we're trying to get clarity on right now, because uh, since we are in phase four of um, the My Safe Start plan, that has greater restrictions on, uh, on people at an event. Uh, you know, right now, I believe it's 100 for an outdoor event. And we don't know yet what that means. And we've asked, does that mean 100 participants? Does that mean spectators exclusive of the participants? Um, you know, when you think about, think about it that way, think about West Bloomfield and Clarkston, if they were to get together on the football field under the conditions that we have right now. Uh, both of those teams almost just with their rosters would put us over the top. And uh, it may be for a while that, um, that schools won't be able to have uh, spectators at events. And uh, we're, we've done some things here. Uh, we're going to allow schools to do uh, more video streaming. Of course, West Bloomfield Schools is part of the uh, NFHS network and has Pixelot cameras installed in the gymnasium and at the uh, stadium. And so they'll be able to stream the games, any game, any level that takes place on those fields out to fans that won't be able to get to the games. And for those schools who aren't part of that program, we're gonna be letting them do it by their own means as well. So uh, they can accommodate you know, all of those people, not just uh, you know, aunt and uncle down in Florida, uh, mom and dad who might, I hate to say that, might not be able to get into a game. So we, uh, we are speaking with John Johnson, Director of Broadcast Properties, Michigan High School Athletics Association. We thank you so much for taking the time to come on to the Oakland County Megacast and talk to us about this very, very important topic that has so many parents concerned, student athletes concerned. I know you guys still have a lot of decisions ahead of you. Thank you for your time and uh, to your organization for your guidance for the parents and the students as well. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you and to help get the word out and help people better understand what's going on. Have a great day, everybody. You as well. So thank you again. And obviously, uh, Tyler, will be checking back in yes. with them. It sounds like more decisions could be made this week surrounding some of the other sports going on here in the state of Michigan. A lot of hard decisions for some of our leaders to make regarding sports because it's more than just the exercise and the athlete. It is about some of these students' futures as well as they try to get college scholarships. So we have just about a minute left in this show, but for all of us here at Civic Center TV, we want to say thank you for tuning in. And again, you can always watch us on Civic Center TV. Birmingham Area Municipal Access 89.3. Listen to us on 89.3 Lakes FM and 88.1 FM The Biff. You can watch us. Uh, the replays will also be on Channel 15 on Comcast, Channel 99 on AT&T. One of the best ways to go ahead and do it, though, is just to log on to Civic Center TV where you can see the replays. But also, we put up uh, shortened clips of all of our interviews. So you can check that out as well. So if you wanna hear from the MHSAA about sports, what's going to be going on, be sure to uh, tune into that. Just click on Civic Center TV and you can continue 
to get all the information. But for myself and Tyler and all of us here at Civic Center TV, we want to say thank you for tuning in and be sure to join us tomorrow with more exciting guests. Um, one last shout out we do want to give to the Greater West Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce for allowing us to be their Facebook friend of the day. Have a good day.